This week on Hometown Ghost Stories. Shortly after the Pritchard family moved into their new home on 30 East Drive in Pontefract, England, they were tormented by poltergeist activity. The haunting centered around 12-year-old Diane, but these strange occurrences were witnessed by the entire family, including neighbors, friends, and relatives. The hauntings quickly escalated from moving objects to potentially life-threatening attacks that left the entire town in shock. Years later, researchers believe they may have uncovered the true identity of what the church determined was an unholy and evil entity. This is Hometown Ghost Stories, the Black Monk Poltergeist of Pontefract, England. Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. The living room was completely soundless except for the rhythmic ticking of the clock on the mantel. Philip sat in the armchair watching his younger sister Diane arrange a deck of playing cards on the carpet in no particular order. He knew what she was doing, the same thing he was doing going through the motions of what normal kids would typically do to entertain themselves. But Philip and Diane weren't entertaining themselves. They were trying to distract themselves from the disturbing reality that their lives had become a living nightmare. A dark presence in the house had been tormenting their families, compounded by the entire neighborhood either treating them like a sideshow attraction or not believing them and deeming them heretics. As terrifying as it was in the house, with all the knocking and banging, objects flying through the air and shadow figures, Philip still preferred being at home than at school, where his classmates would taunt him after reading about his family and their poltergeist in the local newspaper. It was late, but their parents hadn't really been enforcing strict bedtimes since the strange occurrences started. Philip could hear the muffled sounds of his parents talking from their bedroom upstairs. He figured they wouldn't be bothering them to go to bed anytime soon. That's when a familiar chill crept over them. As the temperature in the room dropped, he watched as the hairs on his arms stood on end like tiny soldiers to the general. Diane broke the silence. It's him, she said. It's Mr. Nobody. Philip turned his head in the direction that Diane was looking. There, in the corner of the room, behind the lamp, stood a cloaked shadow of a person. It was a disembodied shadow, but unmistakably that of a human donned in a hood. Philip felt the breath catch in his throat. Just then, the light flickered and the shadow darted across the room. Diane screamed, but Philip was frozen in fear. He wanted to run upstairs to his parents' room, but he was paralyzed with terror. Diane's eyes were wide and bulging, her mouth agape, an expression of abject horror etched on her face. By the time Philip broke out of a state of paralysis, their parents, who heard Diane scream, rushed into the room to see what the issue was. Diane was flailing her arms and kicking her feet. She began clawing at her throat and gasping for air. Philip saw imprints on her neck as if something unseen were squeezing it. Their father rushed to his daughter, but before he could reach her, she was dragged backwards by something that nobody in the room could see. Philip and his parents watched helplessly as Diane was dragged backwards at a frightening speed up the stairs and into one of the dark bedrooms as the door slammed shut behind her. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, The Black Monk of Pontefract. In the late 1960s, the Pritchard family moved into what they thought was an unassuming house on 30 East Drive, East Yorkshire, England. The couple, Jean and Joe, were excited to get their new life started with their two children, Philip, age 15, and Diane, who was 12 years old. It wouldn't be long before they realized they weren't alone in their new home. The haunting began in August of 1966. The first incident was when Philip was alone in the house with his grandmother, Sarah. Joe and Jean were away for the holiday week with Diane. It was a hot day, but the house was curiously cold. As Philip walked into the living room, he stopped dead in his tracks. He saw a white chalky powder floating in the air. The powder was not coming from the ceiling, but about five feet off the ground, as if there was a portal above his grandmother's head, raining chalk dust down on her. 
The powder was so thick that it actually filled her coffee mug. They were both confused by this. Had it been falling from the ceiling, it may have had some sort of explanation, but the fact that it was coming from mid-air left them baffled. Sarah went across the street and retrieved their friend Mary for a second opinion. She too saw the chalky substance and knew it needed to get cleaned up. Sarah went to grab a broom to clean up the dusty mess, and when she returned to the kitchen, a puddle of water had formed on the floor, seemingly out of nowhere. She cleaned that up, but then another puddle appeared, and then another, and another. They called in a plumber, but after inspecting the house, he couldn't find a source of where the water was coming from. They checked under the linoleum, and it was completely dry underneath. It made no sense. That same evening, around 7 p.m., Philip cried out from the kitchen, Grandma, it's happening again. This time, tea leaves and sugar were strewn all around the counter. Then, the button on the tea dispenser started clicking and depressing on its own. It continued to move faster and faster, and was miraculously still spurting water, even when it was empty. Shortly after, they heard a crash in the hallway, followed by the lights turning on on their own. A plant that they had sitting at the bottom of the stairs had somehow ended up halfway up the stairs, but the pot that it was sitting in had repositioned itself at the top of the stairs. Just as they thought their day couldn't get any more bizarre, they heard movement in the kitchen. The cupboard started shaking and vibrating violently as if something or someone was trying to get out. Things seemed to calm down for a bit, but that night, while Philip was lying in bed, the dresser in his room began to shake violently, mimicking the activity that they had witnessed in the kitchen. Philip and his grandmother were so terrified by the events that unfolded that afternoon that they fled the home to sleep at a neighbor's house. After this initial string of events, paranormal activity at 30 East Drive seemed to calm down for a little while, and life went back to normal as Philip and Sarah tried to forget and move on from what they had experienced. They reached out to a paranormal expert who lived in the neighborhood. His name was Mr. McDonald, and he visited the home to see if he could find anything. He searched and found nothing out of the ordinary. As he got ready to leave and was heading for the front door, they heard a loud crash come from upstairs. The Pritchard's wedding photo had gone flying across the room, smashing the frame, and they discovered that the picture inside had been slashed several times, almost as if someone had hacked at it with a knife. The poltergeist was back. The entity seemed to shift its focus. It started with Philip and then quickly switched over to Diane. It's believed that various types of ghosts haunt locations, while poltergeists seem to focus mainly on people. It's theorized that poltergeists seem to feed off the psychokinetic energy as children go through puberty. In this case, is no different. The haunting continued on with different noises, such as footsteps and loud bangs on doors around the house. Next came the electrical disturbances. Oddly enough, and quite contrary to other poltergeist cases, during the haunting that the Pritchard family experienced, their electrical bill was coming in at about half the amount that it usually was at the home, despite the fact that they were using the same amount of electricity. Curious about the change, as well as the odd disturbances at the home, they not only couldn't find anything wrong with the electricity in the house, but also had no explanation to why their bill was so low during this time period. Appliances that weren't even plugged in began turning on on their own, and the lights would constantly be turning on and off when nobody was within arm's reach of the light switches. Objects began to appear and disappear, and on one peculiar occasion, while cleaning out the chimney flue, several keys began raining down on Mrs. Pritchard. It seemed that the poltergeist had collected all of the keys that were lying around the house and then dropped all of them on her at that moment. More family photos were slashed and torn apart, and the knocks, raps, and thuds continued on at all hours during the day and night. One afternoon, a neighbor came to visit Jean for tea. As the ladies were standing at the bottom of the staircase, the grandmother clock at the upstairs landing began to rock from side to side. Suddenly, the clock tipped over and came crashing down the stairs. The women were shocked as they had just been standing in its path seconds before, and now the clock lay broken in pieces at their feet. But their day wasn't over. Jean heard a buzzing sound coming from her wardrobe in the master bedroom. When she opened the door, a swarm of bees came flooding out. She was stung multiple times and blamed the entity that was haunting the home for the sudden manifestation of bees. As the days went by, the poltergeist activity increased inside the house. One day, a different neighbor who lived across the street from 30 East Drive came knocking at their door. He had a look of terror on his face. Jean asked what was wrong. He didn't say anything, but he pointed to the front garden. 
Jean looked at the garden and noticed that it was littered with bedding, clothing, and records that belonged to Diane. They looked up at her bedroom window and saw that it was open. Somebody had gathered nearly all of the contents from Diane's bedroom and thrown them out the window. The issue? Nobody was upstairs at the time. This wouldn't be the only time this happened either. According to a window cleaner, he witnessed the same thing happen in the master bedroom, and then later in Philip's bedroom. Each time, the bedrooms were vacant. Green slime began to emerge from the taps when they tried to turn on the water. A similar substance started to appear in the kitchen cupboards. A sample was taken for chemical analysis, and the material could not be identified. This only lasted for a brief period of time, and then the substance was never seen again. The Pritchards would eventually call the local vicar to assess the situation inside the home. He declared that whatever was haunting this house was unholy and evil. Unfortunately for the Pritchards, the vicar was right, and the paranormal activity within their home would only become more violent and angry after his visit. They gave the poltergeist a nickname. They started calling it Fred. But when the press got a hold of the story, they named him Mr. Nobody. During all of this chaos, Joe Pritchard was having none of it. At this time, he was still a hardened skeptic and blamed his kids for making all this unusual activity up. He would be the final member of the family and seemingly the entire neighborhood to turn into a believer and admit that there was something unexplainable and evil lurking at their house. One day, Joe went into a small coal storage closet downstairs and whatever happened to him in there would stick with him for the rest of his life. According to the few people that he told about the incident, he was attacked by something in that small space which completely changed his outlook on the entire situation. Next, Diane was ambushed as she was heading to bed one night. She suddenly found that the hallway was plunged into darkness. The air turned ice cold as she witnessed a dark shadow that appeared in the hallway. Suddenly, a dark force took hold of a hefty wooden hall stand and used it to pin the girl down. The sheer amount of force it would have taken for any adult, let alone a poltergeist, to lift and maneuver such a heavy item is hard to imagine. The fact that whatever this was was able to lift the item and pin Diane down while still not crushing her to death seemed physically impossible. According to Colin Wilson in his book Poltergeist, Philip and Mrs. Pritchard were unable to pull the hall stand off of her, but when her mother instructed her to relax, suddenly she was able to maneuver it free and clear. The first sighting of the entity was made by Joe and Jean as they were lying in bed. Their bedroom door suddenly creaked open on its own accord. They were astonished as they had both seen the door open, but nothing could have prepared them for what they would witness next. Standing in the doorway was a dark robed figure, its face obscured by his black hood. Joe jumped out of bed and just as quickly as it had appeared, it vanished. According to their neighbor, Elsie May Mountain, she had seen the same dark cloaked figure standing behind her in the kitchen while she was busy at the sink. Eventually, the figure would also reveal itself to a family friend and both of the Pritchard children. The family did everything they could to try to drive this dark entity out, including multiple exorcisms on the home, which only seemed to make the situation worse. Each time, they were met with physical attacks, and as holy water was cast around the house, the walls seemed to reject the water. Neighbors claimed that the outside of the home seemed to glow at night, and everyone in the neighborhood could hear the loud knocks and bangs coming from 30 East Drive, even from their own homes and on the street outside. The most terrifying incident that took place at the Pritchard home happened one night in full view of Jean and Philip. Diane let out a hysterical scream as she was dragged up the staircase by an unseen force. The incident left bruising on her throat as if Fred had grabbed her by the throat to pull her up the staircase. Days later, as the poltergeist activity finally seemed to calm down, Philip witnessed the dark shadow figure one final time as he disappeared into the floor of the house. And suddenly, 30 East Drive was once again peaceful. Diane and Philip would eventually move out and Joe Pritchard died of a heart attack inside the home on June 21st, 1986 in the upstairs bathroom. Jean lived alone with her parrot for the next 25 years before finally saying goodbye to 30 East Drive. 10 years after the poltergeist had terrorized the Pritchard family, Cluniac monk researcher Tom Cluniff started putting the pieces of the past together while looking into the case. He claims that a 16th century monk had been convicted for the rape and murder of a young girl. 
the gallows, where the monk was eventually hanged for his crimes, was located just across the street from where the house now stands. Others theorized that the monk's body had been thrown down a well, which was discovered underneath the home. But this is most likely just a legend for the obvious reason of, why would you poison something as useful as a well when you could just send him to the gallows across the street? Regardless of the true history, the legend of the Black Monk of Pontefract was born. Today the home still stands and was purchased by Bill Bungie, who opened it up to paranormal investigators. Author and paranormal researcher Richard Estep stayed five days and nights and would end up co-writing a book with Bill called The Black Monk of Pontefract, The World's Most Violent and Relentless Poltergeist. This book covers the history and hauntings in the home. Poltergeist activity is still reported at the house to this day, and multiple chilling EVPs and even photographs have been captured of the Black Monk. One picture appears to be the cloaked arm of Fred, likely holding rosary beads, and another picture captured a strange twisted shadow figure. The 2012 horror film, When the Lights Went Out, was based off of the Pritchard's experience in the home, and several documentaries have covered the case, which some say could be the most well-documented poltergeist in the entire UK, rivaling the Enfield haunting. Stick with us as Rob, Dave, and myself dive a little deeper into the terrifying case of the Black Monk of Pontefract. Is going on ladies and gentlemen welcome into hometown ghost stories episode number 125 i'm jesse wilkins i'm joined by rob coakley hello rob what a terrifying place to go to that you can actually go to and we are thinking about going over to the uk next year to investigate a place this might have to uh be a place that we uh consider yeah they i was on the website today they they still do the overnight bookings it uh looks like it's relatively inexpensive i heard a bunch of people complaining about it on like a few podcasts that i was listening to like i can't believe they charge as much i went on it was like 85 pounds that's perfectly reasonable for an overnight investigation so i don't know what they're complaining about but speaking of complaining all the time we're also joined by dave hello dave hello my complaint is that i i don't think the bees had anything to do with the haunting perhaps well I, I, there's so much to this so i covered like some of the main bullet points but there's so much that happened with this place. It's and I left out my absolute favorite story. I can't wait to tell it. Uh, but there, there's so much, and it's still ongoing. So the the poltergeist kind of died down for the Pritchard family. It was a really sad ending for that family. Um, we'll, we'll jump into it in a bit. But for now, let's uh, thank everybody that's hanging out in live chat. A lot of people hanging out. A lot of donations came in. A bunch of gifted memberships. Crazy Legs threw in ten. Uh, Chicago threw in ten. Potato threw in five. Matthew Thomas gifted ten. So thank you guys so much for sending out those um those gifted memberships for those of you that were gifted make sure you say thank you and enjoy your hometown ghost stories emotes more will be coming soon in this episode dedicated to the legendary mod steph a and a patreon member for a long time and uh Woo-hoo. she was one of our first viewers and just uh you know we love steph so author of, of, author. author of the bingo cards the bingo cards helps us with uh, some behind the scenes stuff here and there. So thank you very much and very well earned RIP to Steph A. Yes, yes. All Alive right. and in chat. But yes. RIP. Yes. RIP. Absolutely. Um, and uh, just real quick, anyone that's in the live chat, stay to the end because we have a few announcements at the end of the episode. I don't even know what those announcements are. I'm, just, I'm, I'm excited. You should be excited. <laughs> Anyways, uh, dude, what a wild case. This stuff is, it, it is, it is crazy. And what, what's cool about this one is the Pritchard family, you can draw, all right. So first of all, you can draw a lot of comparisons to this one in other poltergeist cases. It's not necessarily a bad thing. You do, it does raise some signals. Like, are they copying these other cases? Could they just be saying, this is also happening to me? This is like the era of big poltergeist cases, right? Where you have Enfield, you have Amityville, which wasn't really a poltergeist case, but you have all of these things kind of started happening right after the poltergeist movie came out. Or, or, um, not the poltergeist movie, what movie was it? The Exorcist movie. 
So right after that movie came out, all this, you know, all of a sudden these these big cases started happening, which mm-hmm. sent the skeptics wild because they're just saying, oh, you're just you're just doing what you saw in the movie, yada yada yada. Enfield had its flaws, and you know, a lot of people love to try to debunk that case. Every in any kind of case, any kind of haunting, there's going to be skeptics that will go out there and debunk them. There hasn't really been a solid debunking of this one that I know of, and at this point, there probably won't be. So it's a mystery. It's did it happen? Was it faked? This is a case where you have so many witnesses. It wasn't just the family. It was the whole damn neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> so it was yeah. everyone. Everyone was coming by experiencing hauntings at this place. And people that lived there before. Did you yes. did you read about how the family that lived before like yep. convinced the Pritchards to trade houses? I was yeah. like, you can do that? You just trade houses? <laughs> yeah, so I left that out because I wanted to talk about it here. So this stuff is very much unconfirmed. And there's few people will go on record with this stuff again if you guys hear snoring it's my dog snoring behind me <laughs> your new favorite place to sit during the show is right behind me keeps my posture good though so that's always nice but yeah so the, the story with the, the previous family was basically they were getting violently attacked by this poltergeist in particular it was targeting their infant um i don't remember if the son or daughter but their infant and it was cutting up the baby's face yeah. and the, the baby was having it was just waking up bleeding from the face so they first thought that it was just the baby scratching himself or herself in its sleep it was, it was and a girl yeah yeah and this can happen i've seen it happen with babies their fingernails nails get long so you trim their fingernails or they they went so far as to put little mittens on the the baby when when she went to bed and she'd wake up with the mittens still on and she was still having these cuts all over her face and they were experiencing some other things in the house now, again, this is all kind of unconfirmed. I don't think anybody from that family has gone on the record to say whether or not these hauntings actually took place. It might just be a snowball effect from the legend. But apparently, they had just they were just swapped houses with the uh, Pritchard family, which I find to be a weird thing, especially because this was government-subsidized housing as well. Right. It seems like there'd be a lot of paperwork involved in that, but maybe it was a little bit more nonchalant back in the day, or maybe in England things are a little bit different. But yeah, they kind of just swapped spots there, and the Pritchard family was happy to move in, but it was literally like almost right away that the first haunting happened. And a a couple other things that are a little bit different with this case is, so if you look at Enfield, you look at just all your major hauntings, the Conjuring House, all these different hauntings, not necessarily just poltergeist cases, Amityville. There are book deals and there are movie deals that the family profits off of. The family, as far as I know, did not really make much of a profit on any of these books or movies that were made. So there have been plenty of books written. There's been at least two books written on them. The one that I went off of for, for my sourcing was this book here, which I, I pulled a picture of it up, but this is the uh, the Black Monk of uh, Pontefract, which is Richard by uh, written by Richard Estep and, and Bill Bill Bungie, or Bungie. I've heard his name pronounced a few different ways. Um, really good book. And the cool thing with this book, I haven't really seen this before, is they have, when they start talking about a certain haunting or a certain piece of evidence that they captured here, they left little QR codes. So you just scan the QR code and it takes you straight to that video or audio clip of the evidence that they captured. I was like, this is super cool. cool. Very engaged. I was like, all right, that is, that's, I've never seen that before. So that was awesome. Yeah, I've that's seen books cool. too. Sorry. I've seen some books do it with like playlists where like they'll, they'll link you to like a Spotify playlist for like background music while you're listening, reading the book or whatever. But that was new. And uh, to, to, to go off that point, with the family not profiting bill bungie is actually the guy who owns the house now and he released the movie that he was the producer on the movie that came out and he did get in touch with the family and they said they want nothing to do with being interviewed they they want to be as far away from it as possible he doesn't know where they live now and people come and try to interview them and go through bill and he's like a i don't know where they are and b if i did i wouldn't even let you know because that's how far away they want to be from this right and you got to respect that absolutely for sure yeah and i mean the the book was solid i was actually chatting with uh with the author of the book richard today i was going to try to get him on the show to be a guest but he already lined up for a different interview but he's cool he also wrote the uh the book that we based our fox hollow farm investigation on so he's got a lot of a lot of a lot of really cool cases so that's that's funny because i just read an update on fox hollow farm right before we went on the air Oh, what's the update? Um, so they have identified more remains from there, and they have as many as 10,000 remains on the property right now. Like just you're talking about like different bone fragments. That's, what I, that's the way I took it. 
that's the yeah. way I took it. It was it was different, but still, that's a lot. We have like what seven bones in our body, I think. Yeah, right around there, round, you know, roundabout. Maybe twelve. I don't know, somewhere around there. Somewhere between the two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a uh, Irish way. That was an absolutely messed up case, and um, mm. yeah. Anyways, I so, wanna, can we talk about Poltergeist as an entity real quick? Because we had a pretty good question pop up in chat from Allison V. She said, Poltergeist opinions. Is a poltergeist energy manifested by a person? Oh, no, say, yeah. Sorry. I read that correct. Is a poltergeist energy manifested by a person under stress, not really a spirit, or are poltergeist spirits that are attracted to people when going through extreme stress? So basically, I guess, like, are you creating a poltergeist with the negative energy of your str- that comes from your stress. <clears throat> I would say it's probably the other option I think makes more sense to me that there is a spirit and where sp- the theory is that if spirits draw energy from different sources in order to manifest, then I believe that maybe a, a spirit could be drawing that negative energy from the person's stress to manifest itself. Um, I've heard it the other way as well, though. Just yeah. to just to give Allison some credence on that, and believe it or not, I was listening to an interview with Bill today, and they kind of brought something up similar to this in regards to the Black Monk, where maybe enough people had like thought about that or heard about that, and that's why it's manifested uh, as well. And that brought me back to Emily's Bridge, mm-hmm. where we can't confirm that legend either, like that that actually happened, where the girl you know lost her life on the bridge, but something's manifesting there. And it was, is it because people are going there with that energy or not? That's so it's a great question. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. I mean, the the origins of a poltergeist is it is a type of ghost or a spirit. So it likely came from a person. It's not demonic. It's just supposed to be noisy and annoying, which while this story sounds terrifying, right? It's people are getting attacked for the most part, there were so many things that went on in this house that they weren't necessarily scared of it. As weird as that sounds, they are more so just annoyed by it, which is exactly what a poltergeist is supposed to be. Because for the most part, this thing was just messing with them. It's just pulling out a drawer, throwing a cup across the room, just doing all, literally every single haunting that you can imagine in any poltergeist case, this one pretty much did all of it. Like there's just, it was something new every single day. I think after that first initial haunting, it had gone silent for a little while. And I read varying accounts of how long it kind of left them alone for after the first incident with the tea leaves and the, the weird dust falling from the middle of the room. I, I heard up to two years. It went That's silent. What I heard, I heard two right. years as well. So it kind of stopped messing with them, but then it came back and it, it wasn't something that they were terrified of. I'm sure they had terrifying moments, but that was it. And the poltergeist, it, it has four stages. So typical poltergeist haunting. So stage one is known as like the latent dormant passive stage. And this is where like you might have an animal that could be barking at nothing or you might get some cold spots or little temperature changes. So that's like stage one. This thing jumps straight to like stage three or four. But stage two is obvious detections. You get bigger cold spots. Attacks can happen. Uh, That's when you get like you can maybe get scratched or slapped or bit or pinched or whatever. Um. It, it, but you're not going to see it yet. Stage three is like increased kinetic activity. And then stage four would be the intelligent and targeted individual stage. And this is where it picks a person and just starts messing with that person mostly. And this one's a little unique because it picked um, it picked the son first and then it switched to Diane. But it also messed with everybody else in the house. It attacked Joe. It, pre- it, it showed itself to everyone. So it started off with the parents. So it wasn't sticking with diane but it it mainly targeted her and i think that's because for whatever reason this poltergeist activity it seems to pick people that are happen to be going through puberty puberty and she was 12 years old so the same thing in the enfield case so the same thing in many poltergeist cases so what's that so the batters yeah Yeah. better see as well yeah i think pretty much every single poltergeist case that we've covered besides maybe um the one in edinburgh yeah had, had kind of Go ahead. The difference between a lot of those and this one, though, and I can't remember if it's Richard or Bill, but they're starting to lean to thinking this isn't a poltergeist because a lot of poltergeist cases sort of, um, I think they they refer to it as a shooting star where it burns quick, it burns brightly for like a year or two, and then it just moves on. There's no more activity. 
there's still activity in this house to this day. It goes dormant for a while, but then it comes back. So it is behaving like a poltergeist. And hell, we we don't make the rules, right? Like that's a that's our saying, one of our sayings. Right. We are brave, we're well, strong, we are handsome is another. <laughs> it's a new one, yeah. <laughs> one of the theories on why it's still happening here, if it is a poltergeist, is the story is continuing to live on because of what they did with the building. So these other ones, and if, if you go to Enfield, you go to Green Street, you go visit the Enfield house, it's just like you just stop in front of the house, you're like, oh, there it is, cool. It looks exactly like everything else. But the family in there is is not holding events. They're not bringing investigators in. This house was purchased by Bill and he turned it into what, he kept the story going, if you will, right? So the, the story is the poltergeist. People are still going there and reliving that story every day. You go into the house, it looks like you just stepped into a, a, a time travel machine back to the 1960s, 1970s. All the furniture still looks like it, it would back in the day. So they kept everything the same. And in a way, I feel like that's continuing the same story. It doesn't still have the same individual that the poltergeist was targeting, which is maybe why its behavior is more sporadic and all over the place. But I feel like in a lot of these locations, the reason that the activity hasn't really died down is because people like psychopaths like ourselves and other paranormal investigators are continuing to breathe life into this and bring new energy into the house every single day. So it could very well be the case but like we were saying like like this thing skipped like straight to stage four which is when large objects will uh will slide across the room uh you got this one situation with diane where she got trapped by it was like a halls uh, i can't remember the name of the piece of furniture i wasn't familiar with it but apparently it was a big wooden heavy piece of furniture and it trapped her in like this thing for one an adult would have had trouble lifting it by themselves for two once it was on top of her, it should have crushed her. Like she should have been seriously injured, but it was just kind of like, it was just pinning her down, which was physically impossible. And it took the mother and the son to, to pull it off of, off of her. And like the weird wrinkle in that was, they basically told her like, hey, listen, you have to stop struggling and just relax. And once she said that, all they were able to then pull the thing off. Now the skeptics... Go ahead. It's, it's a terrifying thing, but but all I can picture is Beauty and the Beast and that big cabinet yeah. that like that like pins somebody down at one point <laughs> during the big battle. I forget that scene, but I believe you. But and it kind of makes you think. It, it goes back to when they say poltergeists, it they'll they'll hurt you a little bit, but they'll pull back. Like something will zoom. Like they'll throw something a potted plant. They'll zoom a potted plant across the room at your head and it will either just miss you or it'll seemingly slow down before it hits you. So it'll hurt mm -hmm. you, but it won't kill you. And you see this in a, in a lot of different situations where it's like, well, they could have died right there. And it was also kind of responding. It was responding to threats, right? Moving so, the heavy furniture reminds me of the Bridgeport poltergeist that we covered a couple of years ago where it was moving the, those giant old 1980s TVs and appliances and refrigerator and stuff and like where police were witnessing it saying like how the hell is this heavy appliance moving on its own or how is the 12 year old that you're blaming this on moving this moving big it. heavy piece of furniture it same same in uh, same in both situations yeah exactly so i mean this thing was witnessed by everyone it was witnessed by the window cleaner who <laughs> i'm pretty sure he saw two of the bedrooms but it might have just been one but at some point, you're a little creeped out by the window cleaner, right? Like, why are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get away from the windows. How, how did you experience both of those? But anyways, so this How's thing had clean like... the windows if you can't get near the windows. Hmm. How do you have a window cleaner in government subsidized, subsidized housing? I'm Maybe sure the they government have. pays the window yeah, cleaner I would say the to come and does. clean all the subsidized housing windows. All right. Fair enough. I got to keep those windows clean. Um, but yeah, that, that was that was a weird one where that, that one sounded to me like it could have been the kids messing around with they just throw all the crap out the window. Maybe the brother was mad at the sister and went into her room and just threw all their stuff out the window and they immediately blamed the ghost. There could have been a little bit of mass hysteria going on with some of these things. It's almost too much to take in. If you, if you read the book and we linked it in the show notes too. So if you guys are looking for the link for the book, it's there. But if you go through it and you're just like, how in the world did all of this stuff happen? And same thing with the, the house on the 
Enfield case. It was every single page of that book was full of the most crazy shit I've ever seen. And you say most hauntings you could fit in most, most locations, all of the hauntings that have ever happened at a place you could fit in one paragraph of one of these books, but these poltergeist cases are just insane. Absolutely nuts. They are. Yeah. And again, in a short spirit and usually in a short spurt of time too. Mm -hmm. Like that's the difference between these type of cases and other hauntings. We go back to episode one, the Bridgewater house. We have hauntings that we talk about, but from what we know is 1968 to almost present day. And that's still less than what happened at this particular house. This is a great comment right here from nude photo bomb. Just a thought. I wonder if poltergeists do things like throw things at you to create further stress and emotional distress in order to feed and recharge. Oh, that is a good question. That's a good theory. That is a good theory. And it's also, they bring in priests to do exorcisms on the home. And according to a few sources that I read, like this just doesn't work in poltergeist cases. It's not a demon. It's not demonic. And maybe it has worked in the past. Maybe it's calmed things down a little bit in the past, but in this case it was firing things up and it was mocking the church and the church didn't really help. So they did, they sent over a vicar and this guy wanted nothing to do with it. He didn't believe him at first. Then he goes in and candlesticks start flying around and all this crazy stuff. And he's trying to throw the holy water on the wall. And they said the, the, the water was kind of like shooting down the wall or something along those lines. It, it just sounds like that's what water would do. That's if you were water, a wall, that just sounds exactly how water would behave. But they <laughs> wouldn't. Have, they wouldn't have included it if it wasn't natural. But the water was kind of rejecting, or the walls were like rejecting the holy water or something like that. But it. This guy was. He was very scared. He didn't have a lot of courage, if you will. He was like, "I want nothing to do with this. Call the church. I'm sorry. I can't handle this. This is <laughs> this is too much for me." And he and he just got out of there. And they're like, "Wow, I guess the church is going to help us out." But even if they did, I don't think the church could have helped in that situation. Maybe they could have, you know. But <laughs> each case could be a little bit different. Velcro fish stick says gravity is a poltergeist. <laughs> yeah, I read that. I read that in the book, and I was like, "That sounds like what water does." You know, yeah. <laughs> and then even, I heard it in a few podcasts. It'd be even weirder if they threw the water at the wall and it didn't run down the wall. It yeah, just it went made, up. <laughs> yeah, it went up the wall. I'd have some questions. Right. But it, it was funny. It was funny. There's a lot of really funny hauntings in here, which is kind of what they're supposed to be. Now, obviously, the, the dark and dangerous ones stick out, but a lot of them are just so goofy. I would yeah. like to tell you guys my favorite story of all time with this tell haunting. Us. Yes, tell, tell us. us. So mind you, this was many, many years before the Harry Potter books were even written. Mm-hmm. And this sounds like something straight out of Harry Potter. So they had their aunt. I can't remember the aunt's name, but she came by the house because she heard about all this, this haunting think, that was going on. What do you think she probably said when she got there? She was like, oh, what's all this buggery about? <laughs> and she comes strolling in. I guess she was a big heavy set woman and she's comes, you know, and she's, you know, a Christian lady. She's going to prove everyone wrong that this is just the kid. This is just the kids mucking about, you know. <laughs> and, uh, a Hufflepuff. Go on. Oh, for sure. For sure. I'm picturing her holding a rolling pin. <laughs> I want I want everyone in chat to think of the most ridiculous scene that you could think of that's going to happen here. And then I want you to, to be wrong because this okay. is more ridiculous than anything I've ever heard. So she goes in the house and she's stomping about and and nothing's happening. And she's like, she's just came there to prove that there's nothing wrong with the house until the fridge opens up on its own and an entire jug of milk comes floating out of the fridge and just wobbles around on right above her head opens up and turns around and pours all over her <laughs> and, this, and everyone's just laughing because the poltergeist is just messing around <laughs> but it doesn't stop there it doesn't oh. stop there after she's all got the milk all over her head and this isn't this is this is in many sources this is i'm not making this up i promise <laughs> but <laughs> then a pair of gloves floats up as if someone had just put them on and these, these gloves they, do they just dancing her? around. No, but they kind of like, just start doing like, uh, I don't know if they're finger guns, but I hope they're finger guns, but <laughs> like, they're just kind of like, ah, I got you. Uh, and they're doing this little, little dancey thing. And then the, they float upstairs and um, something else happened with the gloves. I wish I got this whole story straight, but I was laughing too hard to figure it out. <laughs> but the, the hands were just, they're being all crazy, these little gloves. And it was, uh, yeah, so she stormed out and never came back. She was pissed. I bet she did. <laughs> she was pissed. This yeah. is, this is definitely a Harry Potter scene, the opening 10 minutes with his, like, a 
his aunt and uncle. Yeah, well, no, no. Do, do you remember the scene? I, I think it was maybe the second movie when he poofed up. Oh, spoiler alert, guys. Uh, where he <laughs> poofed up like his, I think it was another relative or whatever, because she was making fun of his dead parents or something. Spoiler alert. And uh, <laughs> so she poofs up into a balloon and floats away. And, th- and they're British. And this is like the exact same thing. It's all I could think about was you pissed off the wizard in the house. And now you got your aunt floating away all mad with milk on her head. Uh, It was unbelievable. I wonder what she probably said when the milk got dumped on her head. Mm. Cheerio. (laughs) She probably wanted some at that point, right? (laughs) Yeah. She's just going head up fountain, like like a stick your head under a fountain thing. Yeah. Got to do it. Maybe she was thirsty. I don't know. But that was the most ridiculous story of all time. And it would do things like this. Like it would pull like little pranks. And that's kind of what was kind of the definition of the poltergeist, right? Yeah. It's German for pesky ghost. Mm. Or noisy ghost, right? I think it'd be yeah. one or the other. Yes. Interchangeable. But, yeah. Yeah. Banana says no use crying over spilled milk. That's right. And I guess it was the third movie as all of chat has corrected me. The entire chat has corrected you. Yes. Right. Yes. Can, can we talk about, I don't know if you wanted to get into this or if I'm ruining your timeline. Can we sort of talk about the origins of the land and the monk mm-hmm. specifically? Do you, what information do you have? I heard some stuff on it, but. Right. So it was confirmed by, um, it was a Cluniac, Cluniac, I can't remember how to pronounce it, but it, he was a monk researcher. Like this is what this guy researches. And he did the research and he dug up, I don't know what he dug up, but read some scrolls or some shit. I don't know. It was a long time ago, you know, but he, he figured out that there was a monk who did get executed and the gallows would have been located right near the house. They said right across the street. I don't know how they were really able to pinpoint this position, but the way that this part of Yorkshire is, I guess, is it's, it's really high up. And when they would do executions at that time, they would do it at the highest point. So it added up to, in terms of how high up this, this part of the land was, that's, that would be where they had found it. Um, so they did that. I don't know how confirmed it is that they found a well underneath the house, but that I guess could have been part of it as well. Like I said, in the opening, it makes no, it makes no sense for them to throw them down a well. Number one, wells were pretty damn important at that time. Mm-hmm. You have a perfectly fine. Well, mm-hmm. why would you throw a body into the well, especially if the gallows are right there, you just bring them to the gallows. But that was people unless started, they them, unless they, Maybe the well wasn't really a well. Maybe they used it as a place to dump the bodies after they hanged people. Possibly. It could be that. Or the, the well was just close in proximity to the gallows. And the well is, people um, believe that wells can be a source for um, stored energy that could lead to hauntings. Right. So the well thing would make a lot of sense, other than the impracticality of throwing a body in it. But... And maybe they were um, maybe they were just so mad because he was a bad dude, right? Got arrested hmm. for rape and murder. That's awful. Obviously, a huge piece of shit. So maybe they maybe they're like, this isn't good enough just to hang him, throw his body down the well, and we'll just seal up the well and we'll dig a new well, you know, whatever. But can if, I can I ahead. give you my rendition of what I heard for the legend that is unconfirmed for this? Yes, because so, so the monk is was supposedly there, there's no records really of what he did or did not do, but there, the, the legend is there was the monk that did all the things you just said he did, but he was hiding bodies in that well is what I, he was uh. disposing of them in the well. And to your point, that was where they were executing bodies because that, that house particularly. It's completely it, pointless to execute a body. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they were executing people at the top of the hill, and that's where this house is. And it was even the last house that they built here. They don't know why that is, if it was just based on having to seal the well up or because it was the highest point and one of the higher, harder ones to to build. But also, there was a civil war that took place here, and they believe that there was a um, – this is where they would execute sh- soldiers as well because it's the highest point and when you want to do an execution back in the day you would do it at the highest point so that everyone could watch it so right a few different things i mean a lot of unconfirmed stuff but that is a lot of the legend and stuff that goes on there i do wonder how much of it was born after the hauntings were reported because it does kind of add up with a little bit of the hauntings now the hauntings in this house are so random all the poltergeist activity it's like a different thing every single day so it's really hard to say oh this must have had meaning 
but the gloves, you know, didn't or whatever. The jug of milk. Wow, it was probably a cow. I don't know. But the it's tough to say which ones had meaning. But when you think back to the the first initial haunting with the grandmother, Sarah, and she's in the house. And first you have the dust. And they I don't know if they really, really ever figured out what the dust was. They had first assumed that because they did do some renovation on the house when they first moved in, that maybe it was just coming from the ceiling or falling from a light fixture or something, but there was way too much of it. And also it wasn't falling from the ceiling. It was manifesting about five feet off the ground and then just, just kind of snowing down. And they never really figured out where that was from, but that's not my point. The next part was these pools of water that were forming in the kitchen on the floor. And you had first one and she went and cleaned it up. Ghost dandruff could have been it. Yeah, there you go. Debunked. Um, and then she cleaned it up. She went away. She came back. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's there's five more puddles of water. And they just kept going away and coming back and going away and coming back. So this is one of the – and every time they called in a plumber or an electrician whenever they were having these issues. So they got a plumber over there. And he inspected and checked everything. There wasn't even pipes running underneath where the, the water was showing up. So it's like it's not a pipe. And even if it was, you have linoleum on your kitchen floor – it's virtually waterproof. So even if, if, if water is going to pool on a linoleum floor, it's going to kind of like just bubble up underneath the linoleum and that, and, and rarely would it seep through. This was puddling through immediately, but they still did their due diligence and pulled up the linoleum and checked underneath. Not only did they find the source for where the water would come, but all of the wood underneath was, was completely dry. They would have still been wet when they checked it and there was just absolutely nothing. And you had multiple witnesses. You had the grandmother, you had the son, and you had their friend. I think her name was Mary, who had come by to kind of help them out. And they ended up crashing at Mary's house that night because then what followed that was the shaking inside the kitchen cupboards. And then one of the um, one of the dressers upstairs in the son's room, that started going crazy. It was kind of doing the same thing as if something was trying to get out. So that was obviously... So back, back to the water, water, the water puddles really quick. So in old houses <clears throat> and... Uh, and particularly like really old houses, the floors are never really level, perfectly even. They have high points and low points, and they're usually pretty warped. So I've seen in, in situations where there's a water leak somewhere, the water will come from somewhere and it will pool in the low points of the floor, even if it's not actually close to where the source of the water is coming from. So in this case, where this was an actual old house, it could have been something like that. Yeah, maybe it rolled across the floor from somewhere else, but but the Again, they checked and they didn't find a leak in the sink. They didn't find a leak anywhere. They, it wasn't a leaking pipe anywhere. So they didn't really know where the water could have been could coming have been from. A window when it rains. Maybe. But for it to happen that quick and then get cleaned up. But the only reason that I bring that up, because obviously we already touched on it in the episode, is maybe that is where the well got tied into it, where people, you know, water in the well, poison well. And then you also had this weird greed ooze that was kind of foaming out. So you think of maybe that could be spoiled water, you know, or poisoned water or mm. I don't know, dead body water or something. So maybe that's where people started kind of tying in the whole well theory with this haunting. And this is just me, you know, I'm just spitting in the dark here, just coming up with stuff, but uh, that's kind of what it is. Now, actually, I'm, I am glad that Barbara brought up condensation. There's this weird theory. And I believe it was actually Guy Lyon Playfair who authored the book on the Enfield case who had said that in poltergeist cases, you can have these puddles of water form and it's basically poltergeist condensation. And I, I swear to God, I'm not making this up on the spot, but it's basically when a poltergeist starts to become active, they, I don't know, they leak. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but I, I, that's, it's, it's wild that that's a theory, but it is a theory. And um, he's, he's covered a bunch of cases, obviously. He didn't only do the Enfield case, but that, I guess that's a thing that they've seen in a few different poltergeist cases and i guess that's that's what they attribute it to is ghost sweat ed and lorraine warren had a really crazy case and i've referenced it before relating to an elemental poltergeist that was involving water where water would just beat up like big like grape-sized droplets of water would just appear in the ceiling and just fall and splash on the floor and there was no leaks they couldn't find any source for it and things like that. So it was not completely, this wouldn't be a completely isolated event if it were some sort of water situation related to a elemental poltergeist. Yeah. And I really shot myself in the foot by covering like the San Pedro haunting and the, um, what was the name of that other case? 
I don't remember. There was another Poltergeist case that I'd covered like almost back to back because now I get both of these cases completely confused, but complete, you know, forgive me if I, uh, the, the entity house, that was the second one. Yeah. And they were so similar that it's like, I shouldn't have covered them so close together, but I had no idea it would be like that until I looked into it. But mm-hmm. in one of those cases you had, I think it was like a, a red slime that was appearing and it was leaking from the faucets and then it started in the cabinets as well. And different color, obviously they thought it was blood at first, but they went and got it sampled. I think it actually came up as, as part human blood, which was really weird with that chemical analysis. But this was the only other poltergeist case that I can think of where it also showed up inside of the cabinets. That's such a strange detail. And they Mm. are, they are the same. I do believe that this one was before the entity case. I think the entity house might've been in the eighties, but I'm probably getting that wrong. Again, covered way too many of these. It's all it's all meshing together now. But that was a detail that stuck out to me, where you had the ooze that was dripping. We've seen that. We've seen it as you know, black uh, ooze that was coming out. Was that Amityville where they had um, Amityville had green slime? Oh, it was a green slime. Jeez. Mm-hmm. So Bla- the black ooze was uh, uh, San Pedro, wasn't it? Maybe. Yeah. It's all one giant poltergeist case at this point, but you see the, yeah, you see the comparisons or you, or you see the, um, the similarities between these cases. Yes. And I think that's, that's gotta be part of why they think it's a, um, a poltergeist anyways, obviously a poltergeist activity. I don't know what you would rule this as other than a poltergeist. Maybe they're trending towards demonic here, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Because the, <clears throat> the later stages of poltergeist activity and the early stages of demonic oppression, uh, can be very similar. Right. Yeah. I, and I, and they didn't specifically come out and say demonic. They just said something else. And they're basing that just off the longevity of the haunt more than anything. Mm. And to that point, sure, I, I get that because we do see a lot of the poltergeist cases go and come relatively fast. Mm. And they don't usually last quite as long. But again, we, we don't... what we don't know the time frame of it, right? Like just because we see most of them short, we don't know every poltergeist case either. Right. So like, like we don't know all these cases, but there could be outliers. Things mm-hmm. could last longer. We just, you know, we don't know. Like, I, I just, I don't know how we determine that without getting to your point, to the point Jesse made. It all sounds like a poltergeist. Yeah. Doesn't sound overly evil other than the stuff with the first family. That seemed a little more evil than anything. And then it didn't do that again. Yeah. Kind of. There were still attacks though. So it yeah. yeah it is yeah. weird that that they were so cool with this haunting and they they, they weren't scared. They didn't want to leave the house either. They were cool with the house. They traded for that house. They're keeping their trades, no trade backs. <laughs> and <laughs> they said they didn't want to go. And to be fair, I mean, the mother, she she didn't leave this house for a long time. And it was sad because Joe died in the house and he died of a heart attack. And I didn't see any of the books and now it's a death and it's relatively recent, not super recent. It was in the eighties, but dying of a heart attack in a house where haunted shit, poltergeist activity, where a poltergeist has been actively scaring the shit out of your family for 20 years. Obviously the first couple of years were the, the busiest points, but they said that the activity never really died. It just really, really, really dialed it back. You do, my brain goes to, did it give him one final scare? Because it did attack him in, in the, uh, the coal storage room. So, I mean, yeah. there's no way to prove that ever. No. But dying, you know, dying of a heart attack in that house, in the, you know, in the bathroom of that house, basically at the top of the stairs where the staircase is so haunted. In this case, you have the grandmother clock, which I didn't know was a thing. Had to look it up, make sure it wasn't a typo in the book. It's a grandmother clock that got pushed down the stairs. And you had the, it actually really started. You also had the potted plant that kind of like separated into three different pieces on the stairs, which is kind of a silly one. Again, a lot of silly hauntings in this one, but that's kind of what a poltergeist is. And so a potted potted plant walking up the stairs. (laughs) Yeah. And then you had basically the threat or the, the, it, it felt like it was a sign. It was trying to show the family that it was still in control when it grabbed Diane and dragged her backwards up the stairs. Also, that's going to be hard to fake if you Mm -hmm. are faking it. Right. So it grabbed it by the neck. They said that they could see the finger, like the fingerprints in her neck, like the, the bruising as if someone had grabbed her by the neck and dragged her up the stairs. So the injuries were there. You know, you can't really defy physics like that. That's, that's a difficult one to do. And uh, there were two witnesses on that one. All of these major, major ones had, had hauntings. But again, it had to do with the staircase. So it started with the staircase. 
in the middle, you had the gra- the, the grandmother clock with the staircase. You had the, the physical attack, which seemed to be like the, the tipping point of that. Like the final blow could have been her getting dragged up the stairs or the most tragic of all, did the ghost cause the heart attack or did the mm-hmm. poltergeist scare him enough? It might not, it might not have even meant to. It might have just done something to mess with him. Might have been came in, dumped a jug of milk on his head, did a little glove dance, and then he had a heart attack and was like, "Oh shit, I'm sorry." You know, <laughs> you, don't, you don't know. Right. I, I did see a question earlier asking if it was just at this house or if the neighbors had anything. And from the reports that I saw, the neighbors had some mild hauntings around mm-hmm. the area, so it wasn't just this house, but this was where the house was concentrated, and to the point that some of the neighbors were blaming this house for their hauntings, and it's like. I don't think that they wanted that to happen. Like they weren't sitting there trying to make your house haunted, you know? They were definitely super curious, but you had the neighbor. So it was like a duplex, right? So it, or it had a, one shared wall. It didn't have someone on the other side. Yeah. And a lot of the hauntings that they would hear, because they would hear knocks and bangs. And a lot of times they would say, oh, it's probably just the neighbor hanging up a picture or something. That was when the haunting first started. It was especially Joe, who's a huge skeptic on this. So he's trying to just blame everything because they share a wall with their neighbor. Right. But a lot of the hauntings seem to be coming from the opposite side where they weren't sharing a wall with a neighbor. And it seemed to be intentional. Like, hey, no, nah, that's not me. That's not you hanging a picture. That's me messing with all of your pictures. They were constantly, they said at, towards the end of this thing, they couldn't hang anything on the walls. There's just every picture would just get, they go, nope, nope, don't like that one. Don't like this family is just chucking pictures. And also it wasn't just breaking a picture. It was like, you know, slashing it with like claws or a knife or whatever it would slash it with. So it seemed to be Hensdale sending a message too. Where the picture was stabbed, just like at the Hensdale house. So right. also a, um, a correlation there. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, everybody in the family saw it. It says something to the case that, you know, Joe was obviously a skeptic and he was, you know, him and his wife were the first ones to see the ghost um, appear and he appeared to look like a monk. So it's not just the historical ties that you have with the area in the execution of the monk that could have taken place in that area, but also everyone who saw this thing said it looked like a monk. It looked like it was wearing, you know, the cloaks and, and had a um, had a hood on. And also it wasn't just their family that saw it. They had multiple people that saw it. And also it went and it visited the neighbor. I think we started talking about the neighbor as well. So Mm -hmm. she had said that while she was doing dishes one day, she looked up into the reflection. I don't know if she was looking out the window or a mirror or whatever. And she saw the the cloaked figure behind them. And after that first time that, that Joe and his wife saw it, they compared notes with the neighbor. And she's like, that's exactly what I saw. That's exactly what I saw in my kitchen. So, um, there's just too many witnesses for me to, to rule this one out. Yeah. Gotta go. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a fun one, man. There's, there's so much going on here. There's so many fun, fun things that we need to talk about in this, in this with the hauntings of it, but it's a cool one. And, and I mean, you can book this house. You can book this house. If you're in the, the UK, it's kind of, I, I believe it's a little bit nor- more Northern. So North I think if we were, right? Yeah. So I think if we were to do this, I think we would do this and then go to Scotland and do uh, or, Edinburgh. Yeah, Edinburgh's there or um, Bamburgh Castle. Oh, up there also. Awesome. Yeah. So it's Chillingham. Mm. So there's a lot, a lot of, of goodies. There's a lot of really cool castles to go to. I don't know about this house. But, I mean, I'd love to. Oh, I would absolutely. If we're, if we're in the area, I would absolutely do an overnight here. Yeah. yeah. Can't not do it. I mean, it's actually available to book. I don't know. Like, we could go visit these castles. I don't know if they're actually going to give them to us for, a haunt, for an overnight investigation. Give me your castles. Do you know who we are? <laughs> We have one investigation video. You need to let us do this inve- investigation. That's right. I we, have, we have several investigation videos. We have one like full, one full length. length. Yeah. What were you going to say, Dave? Really? I came across this interesting article here, not directly related to this, but indirectly. And the article is t- it's short. It's, I just thought it was interesting. It's titled, UK is running out of ghosts as old spirits are dying off, paranormal expert says. And that caught my eye. I'm like, what do you mean the UK is running out of ghosts? So the, the theory is Britain is facing a ghost shortage as aging spirits are passing over to the other side, according to a leading paranormal expert. Dr. Paul Lee believes that UK's spectral heritage is in serious decline as many ghosts have become dormant or moved on. The paranormal researcher and author shared, since January 2020, I've been contacting all the reportedly haunted locations on my app 
and asking the residents if and asking if the residents, owners or staff have experienced any unexplained activity. And he's saying that reports are weighed down. Now I have several problems with this. <laughs> I have a, I have a few questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, number one, just because the people who are there saying saying they haven't experienced anything in a while doesn't mean anything. I hate all. to break it to this guy. And again, we don't make the rules. So maybe there is a little bit of a ghost shortage going on here. None of what he said matters at all. Nothing. Not a single Not, thing. Nothing applies to anything. <laughs> but maybe, you know, we're, again, we don't make the rules. We, we, we don't have a, a counter on this thing, but. The theory's flawed. Like are new ghosts not being made every day? Right. In like, do, do they just stop happening? If they, yeah. if they, if they existed, right. In ancient times and in the colonial times and well, UK, not really colonial, but then wouldn't they, if they were real back then, wouldn't they still be real now? Like, wouldn't it? It's just, theory. unless they had a shortage on people dying, I don't think you're going to have a shortage yeah, on, <laughs> on ghosts. I, I think that's kind of how it works. We don't know, but I, I, I don't know. <laughs> We yeah. could do a whole show on this because <laughs> I know. I thought about saving this for a uh, uh, the news update, the paranormal update that we do, but uh, I, f- I felt it was kind of pertinent to this story. Yeah, it is a little it bit. Just so- it just sounds like, and this actually reminds me of one investigator that I wanted to bring up about this case. It just it sounds like one of those people that steps into a haunted place, doesn't find anything in ten minutes, and then writes an article about how not haunted the place is. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that kind of happened with with this one. So I was actively searching. Because I like to do our due diligence and say this person or this skeptic presented this case, found this thing out, you know, like the the friend of the daughter, maybe the daughter told that friend that she was making up the whole thing for attention. You had these, oh, almost every one of these cases is controversial and you have a serious case to debunk it. And we try to be fair and bring up that point as well, because we're not just going to go all in on any story. We're going to bring up both points because that's kind of what the show is about. And we just shoot it to you straight. Like, all right, here is the evidence for the haunting. And here's the evidence that it could be faked. And if there's glaring problems with the case, like, you know, people getting caught faking stuff or edited footage. Now there are, okay, we'll get into that in a second. Let me finish this point. But there was this one guy who was trying to set up an overnight thing at the house. And I don't know if this is when Bill owned it or before or whatever, but I don't know if they didn't get along or whatever, but he's basically just like, nah. And I, I don't want to put words in Bill's mouth. I don't. Th- I don't know if it was Bill or somebody else. I briefly read over this story because it, it was short. Basically, this guy ended up sneaking into the house with another paranormal group, pretending to be someone else. I would like to imagine that he wore a fake mustache. I don't know if he wore a fake mustache, but I'd like to think so. That sounds like a lot of fun. Oh, you never seen you never seen me before. I got mustache. And um, <laughs> I like to think he wore like maybe the disguise with the glasses and the nose and the mustache. That'd be a little yeah. much, but that'd be Groucho funny. mask. Yeah. You don't, rec- you don't recognize me, mate. <laughs> Anyways, goes in, does the little tour. I don't know how long he stayed, but then, not, you know, he didn't experience anything paranormal. So he's like, debunked. This place is not haunted. Ab- absolutely nothing happened in that house that night. It was only <laughs> ordinary. <laughs> That's Jeffrey Wilkins to our English listening audience. You can direct all hate mail to him. <laughs> well, not all of you guys sound like that. Just the, just the lazy skeptics. Yeah, <laughs> wearing the little little disguise. That was the skeptic impression. Yeah, that was that relaxed. Was. <laughs> when I like them, I do the the high pitched yeah. female impression. That's well, I don't like them. He's a little a little bloke. Don't take Football. offense. That's, that's just what skeptics sound like. <laughs> we are excited that Peaky Blinders debunk this house. <laughs> Yeah, so I, 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 he did not present a compelling case to debunk the hauntings in this house. So you have the fact that nothing has really been super debunked. Now, I've seen some pictures, and I, I included a few of them. By the way, we should talk about that real quick. The Whatever image they got with that monk's like cloaked arm holding the rosary bead, that was freaky. Yeah. I have no idea what that was. The other image, and I'm not sure which group got this one. I think it was one of the bigger shows, but it was kind of like a twisty shadow man. That looked like some, maybe a trick of the camera. Not that they faked it, but it looked like maybe someone like walked by exposure. real fast. Maybe double exposure situation there. It looked too much like a person, if mm-hmm. that's not strange enough. The other ones, I don't know. But I saw some really, really bad ones that really looked Photoshopped. And this is what you're going to get when you just, you know, 
charge a fee and let anybody come in the house to do an investigation is some people are probably not going to be honest about it. And they mm -hmm. just want to make a headline and they want to chase the cloud of, of we caught this photo. But I saw some brutally Photoshopped ones. I did not include those in the video portion of this. So if yeah. you watch the video, those are all the photos that I thought were cool. But yeah. there are some bad ones out there. But overall, the family didn't really make money off the case. And there hasn't really been a good debunking of this case. So as far as I'm concerned, it seems pretty damn legitimate to me. You know, what's interesting about this one that sets it apart from a lot of the other poltergeist cases that I've read about is that in almost all of them, they always catch the kids faking stuff. Yeah. And they, we always, then it always starts the conversation of was, were they faking everything or were they just faking some of it? This one, I don't, I didn't see anything where the kids ever got caught faking anything. Right. And maybe, See, this one's also a little bit different because as far as I know, I don't think they're doing like interviews and stuff, right? So they're staying away from the case. So it seems like it's they've they've shut the door on that. There's mm -hmm. no they're, they're, you're not going to be able to pick their story apart if they refuse to even talk yeah, about it. So true. that's why I'm saying we'll never know one way or another. The only way that we can try to confirm anything is to when we're over there, maybe visit this place, book an overnight stay. I would love to sit down and talk with with Bill and Rich and, and see what they experienced in that house. Because Richard, like like what it, like I said in the the opening there, he didn't just write a book about the case. He went in and Stay stayed there. in the house for yeah. multiple nights, and they caught some cool evidence. They caught an uh, a, a mirror. They had set up a voice recorder, and they left and uh, went to go get dinner. And they came back, and when they came back, one of the mirrors had smashed. So they immediately now they didn't really know Bill that well. They were immediately like, maybe it was Bill, or maybe someone snuck into the house and went and broke that mirror just to, you know fake something and prove that the house is haunted. So they went back and, and nobody had known, even his own team didn't know that he had put down a, a voice recorder. So they went through the voice recorder and I have to give them credit on how diligent they were with this part of the investigation. They went through the footage and they listened back. They never heard a door open. They never heard a footstep, but they did hear the mirror smash. So what they did was they didn't just stop there. They went back and had every single member of the team try to as quietly as possible come from outside and retrace whatever steps that person would have taken, open the door as slowly and as quietly as possible, and then just quietly and softly walk up the stairs and do whatever you would have to do to fake it. And every single time it was blatantly obvious that someone was coming in the house, no matter how hard they tried to be as sneaky as possible. Every single time it came up on the voice recorder, they put it back in the same spot that it was rolling from. And they're basically like, at this point, we don't know why the mirror fell off the wall. It could have just fallen off the wall. So I did include footage. I don't. I, it was. It's hard not to laugh at this footage because it's the baby carriage falling down the steps. So for audio listeners, first of all, why are you still an audio listener? Go over to Spotify. You could do it. You could watch and listen. But if you're listening in the car, it's fine. I wasn't trying to. I wasn't trying to say don't listen. Definitely, definitely keep listening. But you should be watching. You should be watching. But we included this video. I grabbed this one. It was just posted by some paranormal group that stayed there. It was at the staircase, and they put a baby carriage with a a toy baby, not a real baby. It's very important to do this. You don't want to do this test with a real baby. Mm. Very dangerous. So they put, <laughs> depends on the baby, I guess. <laughs> but anyways, they put, they put the toy at the top of the stairs and the footage was quick. So it looks like maybe it just, it looks like it might've been faked because I only, I'm not going to include the whole, you know, 10, 15 minute video or whatever, but <laughs> just bad advice. Take it off the screen, Dave. <laughs> Joy B says, watch and drive. Um, <laughs> but two birds. The footage is, 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 a little bit longer so you can watch the whole video and you see this thing just sitting at the top and then eventually the thing just does come tumbling down the stairs and you don't see anybody in the video you don't see any camera shanks camera shakes so it's not like somebody off screen was just jumping up and down on the floor to make the thing move a little bit completely possible it's an older house that is just not level and it could have this is a baby carriage on wheels it could have just rolled slowly slowly to the edge without a poltergeist pushing it but that was kind of kind of cool footage so we included that um i have a hard time saying definitively that it was paranormal because it was on wheels and it probably was not a completely level house. Right. So I have a hard time hundred percent saying that was a ghost. If it wasn't on wheels, you have a better case. Mm. But we have a hard time. I mean, just everyone should have a hard time believing any evidence, right? Unless you experience it yourself. So we, we say that when we present evidence as well, it's, it's, it's so different when you're there. And I'm not saying this is real or not real. I'm just saying, like, if we got that on camera and it was real, like it, like it, it actually happened. Who, 
I I wouldn't expect anyone to believe it. I don't even know if I'd want to. You know what I mean? You, know, like, you shouldn't take anything at face value. Always question question everything, and definitely try and falsify anything that doesn't seem like it makes sense. It does kind of suck though, doesn't it? Like when when something's really good, you're like, nah, it's too good. Right. That, that's what we talk about <laughs> as being a problem all the time. Right. Because like we could have gotten some of the best evidence that people have presented evidence and we're like, no, nah, not real. It's okay. Like, so based on what? Like, at face you know, value. Right. So we just talked about this. At face value, the two pictures, the two main pictures that I love from these hauntings are the picture with the, the cloaked arm looks like it's holding a rosary in the picture of the twisty shadow figure. But my brain goes to, I don't think the picture of the twisty shadow figure is actually a picture of the ghost. Now I'm not saying that it's faked evidence. I just, it looks like a, a glitch in the camera. It looks like maybe somebody had walked by because it actually looks like if you look at the picture, I don't know if I have it on deck. It actually looks like someone is is standing looking at their cell phone. Mm. Yeah. Which I don't think the monks had cell phones back in the 16th century, but you can't rule it out. It could have yeah. been a ghost picture, but this is a classic case of the picture is too good where your brain immediately goes to, well, I think it's probably just a picture of a person, right? Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, yeah this case is crazy. This was a this was a good one. Nice, nice find. Hell yeah. All right, you have some announcements. Unless there's anything else you guys want to touch on in this case. Again, there's a lot to it. I'd recommend reading the yeah, book. Read the book. Um, yeah, read the book. It's a good. There's, one. A lot there's, of fun a, stuff. there's another book too. I couldn't get my hands on it. The book uh, Poltergeist by I think it was Colin Wilson. Mm-hmm. Poltergeist with an exclamation point at the end of it. I I couldn't find a copy. Poltergeist. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um. So, main announcement is. Next two weeks, we have gone live every week for the past two and a half years, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Haven't missed a Tuesday, whether one of us has to miss the week or not. There's been a show every week, and there will be a show the next two weeks is the first thing I will say. Um, However, they are going to be premieres like we did with the Hinsdale House investigation video. We are going to take a break which isn't really a break. We got some stuff to work on behind the scenes. So the next two Tuesdays, we'll be in chat with you but we're going to do premieres on the next two episodes so yes they will yes, not sir. be um, live that's the main announcement yes travel and jesse is traveling again so i i, I will probably not be in live chat because i'm going to be well jesse will be overseas but I'll, I'll be there and i'm sure dave will pop in as well yes of the live chat. but you'll still get your content as normal every tuesday, tuesday night for the lot for a live premiere wednesday for the podcast friday for side content we'll have all of that um, we've started making sure that we get special Patreon content up every week, last month's, I mean, every week, every month, last month, we did a very cool thing that Dave came up, found with hauntings on an airplane, which was terrifying. Mm-hmm. We'll have a new one for June as well. And we have a lot of stuff coming up in the next few weeks that we'll be announcing, but I'm just going to tease it a little bit. You're going to have an opportunity to go on an investigation with us in October. So Oh, we'll yeah. announce that in a few weeks on what what that actually entails. Yes, we're still pulling together the details on that, but spooky season is approaching. Uh, so that's the investigation stuff. We're also putting together a um, another like c- celebration. So last year we had the hundredth episode celebration. I don't think it's going to line up with episode two hundred because I think no, especially with this hiatus. No, that, that's not how this works. So we're not going to get <laughs> seventy five episodes by October. <laughs> yeah. That's not yeah. going to happen. That's a yeah. lot of work. Um, yeah. <laughs> Paranormal Portal gifting five hometown ghost stories memberships. Thank you so Ooh. much, Brent. You're an absolute legend. Guys, if you haven't followed or subscribed to Paranormal Portal yet, do so. You've seen him in, on the show many times, and we bring him on for two reasons. Number one, he knows what he's talking about. Number two, he's incredibly handsome. So sure. definitely go subscribe to Brent over there at the Paranormal Portal and check out his show. And thanks again for that. Sure. I got a couple quick uh, Spotify comments. One is from Christio. Jesus uh, Christ. Hold your horses. Test me another $50. Oh, wow. Super chat. Test. You don't have to do this. You're amazing. Amazing show. I'd love to donate more, but Rob decided to be a pizza tyrant and didn't save or didn't share his pizza with the class. So I had to order my own pizza with extra onions from Mass and the delivery fee to California cleaned, cleaned up. My yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tragic story. But pizza mm-hmm. from Mass is no joke. Pizza from Mass, much better than pizza from California. Yeah, we'll go out and let me say that. Not even, not even close, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. People say Connecticut is king. I'm not to now. I can't go out there and say it's not because I haven't tried it yet. But mm. oh, New Haven has New fantastic Haven. pizza. Yeah, that's what New I've Haven heard. Best. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, New York's pretty good. Massachusetts mm-hmm. is good. Uh, the rest of the country is not good, and your di- deep dish in Chicago sucks. Yeah, that's a lasagna. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> like nonsense is what. However, I also haven't tried a Chicago deep dish pizza. Oh, it's I've had Chicago, Chicago style. <laughs> I've had Chicago, yeah, but Uno's doesn't count. You gotta, you gotta go to Chicago. I did like that's until fair. I judge pizza from Chicago or New Haven, Connecticut, and say Massachusetts is better. Like if you haven't tried it, you don't know. No, <laughs> so, it's, it's like pizza soup. We don't yeah. we we don't condone that. Mm-hmm. Um, you got a young, Youngstown, Ohio pizza. No, uh, all right. Let's out of here. Youngstown, I went. Ohio. Okay, I'm gonna go on the rant. I went to Ohio, and I looked for pizza, and I finally found one pizza shop that wasn't like I couldn't even find chain pizza there for the first for you know just to jump off. Yeah, couldn't find a Domino's or a pizza. I finally found like a. Like a house of pizza type deal. And honestly, I, honestly, you should probably just, you should probably just stop right now because you were actively searching for a Domino's or a Pizza Hut. So no, I was I looking don't. for anything. It's fucking Ohio. There's nothing there, Jesse. It's Ohio. So I finally find this pizza place, and I get it, and they used like store bought ragu as their sauce for the pizza, and it was mm. the most disgusting pizza I ever had in my life. Screw Ohio. And your garbage pizza. Worst pizza I've had in my life was at my son's birthday party. Oh, yeah. And um, it was a bouncy house place. So I couldn't believe their pizza wasn't phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. Shocker, right? <laughs> <laughs> but we're like, you know, I, can we bring in our own pizza? We're surrounded by phenomenal pizza places. And they're yeah, like, no, yeah. you, if you're going to do pizza, you have to eat our pizza. And I took one bite. I'm like, why did you make me do this? <laughs> like, I would have I would have paid you the money for the pizza to let me bring my own pizza. <laughs> yeah, we can put my pizza in your box and just <laughs> pretend. Because this is Joey's, Joey's calling you out. He said, I can already tell you weren't in Youngstown. He said, the rest of the state doesn't count. Right. Joey, nobody goes to Youngstown, Ohio yeah. on purpose. Yeah, why would I be in Youngstown, Ohio? I've, I've, I think I've been to Youngstown. Maybe oh, we got a live Ohio. show in Youngstown, Ohio in February if you want to come out. And- <laughs> Please bring pizza. Yeah. No, no, no. Again, bring pizza. Won't, won't knock it until I try it. That's that's for sure, especially when it comes to pizza. Anyways, uh, this isn't a story about ghosts, so let's uh, let's go ahead and end the show. <laughs> Thank you guys yeah. for tuning in. We appreciate it. Oh, are you going to read a review? Is that what was going to happen? I, I have two real quick ones. Right. Uh, these are Spotify reviews. The first one's from the Brushy Mountain. Christy, Christy Joe. Uh, she said it was interesting to hear about this place. I had a family member that was an inmate there. He was released in 05 and he told me there was something not right in that place and um in regards to the paranormal. Hmm. And then we also got a birdcage theater review, which was our second episode. Ooh. And Stephanie said, I actually have been to Tombstone, Arizona. There's a feeling when you walk through the areas that scream paranormal. The birdcage has a dark feeling inside that building, but it is a beautiful place to visit. Oh, yeah. So if you want your review read, you can either comment on an episode or leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or send it in on YouTube, Facebook, wherever you listen to us. And we can, uh, we'll, we'll read it out on the show. If you have already left a review, feel free to update it or just say something nice on Spotify because yeah. we'll read that too. I read anything. I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> so that will pretty much do it for this week. Oh, no, Patreons. Patreon. Oh, my goodness. Well, for, almost forgot. In the meantime, one more time, big shout out to Steph A. That's who we dedicated this episode to. Again, she's been a patron for a long time, and she has been absolutely dependable and just killing it on Discord and helping us out with all the mod stuff. So we do appreciate you. And let's go ahead and thank our other patrons real quick. As we jump into it, starting with our VIPs, we have Tess, who just dropped $50 again in Super Chat. Ooh. Absolute legend. Legend. Uh, you are one of a kind, Tess. We love you. Uh, we also have Dave D, Kate and Steve M, Blazora, Glitter Tees, Cammy from Washington, Siobhan, Not Sharon, Kelly C, Nick, Donnie N, Inspires Gaming, Allison V, Robert H, Anna C, J9, Mallory K, Mom and Pops, Wilkins, Lisa J, and Dyslexic Stoner 240. Ah. ah, I like it. Oh, <laughs> I, I, heard, I heard a rumor, and I don't know if this is true. And I'm just going to bring it up because we have a lot of people watching in chat. Is it true that dyslexia doesn't apply to numbers? Is it just words and letters? That's what I've heard. But I don't know. And if he's actually dyslexic and got 420 backwards, then maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Let me know. Let me know how dyslexia works. 
Speaking of which, let me try to read the rest of this list. So we have Serena, Shauners, Apple, Steph, Leslie, F, Michelle, Michelle, Rachel, G, Her Lady, Spookship, Nefarious, Chad Poles, Wahini, Pirate, I Am the Bridge Witch, and I Hate Rob, Julie Gooley, Eugene, M, Kath, Q, Slimer, The Green Bed Wedding, Poltergeist. Mm. Nice. Uh, DC, Chris Connolly, LBP, LBPS founder, next, HTGS guest, the other, Rachel B, Sarah Cook, Stitch Kitten, Amby Rose, Janice G, Lily, Rachel B, Seven Bones, Rob, at the bottom. <laughs> I understand. Seven yeah. bones rob at the bottom of the well. Yes. <laughs> That's how many bones the human uh, anatomy has. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I've got a whole bunch of no's in chat. It also applies to numbers. Okay, cool. Yep. All right. Clean that up. I, I didn't make it up, so, but whoever told me that made it up. So I, I always want to get to the bottom of that. Anyways, uh, we also have a demon child. I could have just Googled it, but here I am living my whole life in wonder and mystery. Anyways, a demon child that is planning a slow death on you. Papa Squatch, my hauntings will be weirder than today's episode SA. Oh, yeah. That's going to be a tough one, but uh, this was a wacky one. I don't know if it gets weirder than the gloves. <laughs> you know, uh, Stan, the man with the ham hands and loving it. That's the Warren's Wards. Thank you so much for being on Patreon. There was the pair of slippers that walked around the house in the Battersea Poltergeist case. That was fun. That, that was, was fun. fun. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Thick Boy F, allegedly poorly christening the Al Capone's boarding school for harshly yeeted orphans <laughs> at half skeeted spank uh, and half skeeted spank bacon. How does he get so many words? <laughs> does he have a deal with Patreon? Well, I think he finally did hit the limit because he had to change Thick Boy Freddy to Thick Boy F. So, ah, okay. Yeah, I think we finally <laughs> found the limit. Uh, Christina S, Kate C, Chrissy, Kelly C, Isla D. I hope I got that right this time. I'm not going to try it a different way. We're just going to see whether or not it's right. Cyclone Richard Twirler. Don't ask your parents what that means. Crazy Legs 2005, The Potato Geist versus Deviled Ham. <laughs> West Virginia Coal Miner, hashtag The Revenge of Cake Dave. Jesse is brave. He is strong. He is not handsome. Why would you make me say that about myself? <laughs> <laughs> we have just call me Bree, Miss Macabre, Team Jesse Forever, Naroku, Cold Warrior, Rob Fierce, Zach Baggins. <laughs> Please don't cancel us. That is, that is he who shall not be named. We're not allowed to say that name on the show. Uh, I, we have, I have come here to create witty Patreon names and subscribe to creators, and I'm all out of witty Patreon names. D from H-Town, Meta A, Sarah B, Dominica, it's Valak. Valak? This is one of those that this is one of those that I should I should fucking know how to say it. And every time I look at that word, I'm like, Valak. <clears throat> Valak. Valak. <laughs> Monster Mom 04, Ali, Dark Snark. Hey Siri, set a reminder at for 3 a.m. to I can't read that one. <laughs> Cosmo, come on, dude. Uh Megan S. <laughs> Morgan S. I'm a scary man. Oh no, I'm a I'm a scary man fish. <laughs> Sharon V. Arcade H. Wayne C. White glove treatment with a ghost milk facial and crystal quinn as well as good old colby daddy rob is the greatest thick boy freddie eats jesse's farts alicia e i'm gonna go back and read colby's name because i thought i thought he was saying that i'm gonna make out with rob but maybe not i don't know siri's going to set a reminder at 3 a.m to make out with rob for pride month so that is not his cosmos <laughs> it is pride month so why not uh thick boy freddie uh, where did i leave off uh, Daddy Rob is the greatest thick boy. Freddy eats Jesse's farts. We have Alicia E. Thick boy Freddy allegedly poorly manifesting a wonky poltergeist that only eats orphans. His thick wife and sometimes Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a clever name that really spooks Jesse. The baby ghost peed my bed. Sam from Nepal, Joe R. Paul from St. Louis, Al Capone. I miss when shows were all about me. Huggy Bear. I can't think of a clever Patreon name. So, yay. Mariah M. Curially J. And then page two. Boom, boom, boom. We have Anthony. Hey, Rob. I'm sorry for making fun of you all. Fun, fun of you most of the time. Just too much fun, T. Uh, Cody G. Brandon W. Hoopley Whoopley. Bridge Witch. And the Polka Geist. Oh. Which is Andrew, who is... <laughs> Might be the only accordion player in chat also. Very yeah, good. So, most likely. So, yes, thank you so much for being on Patreon. $3 a month at least will get you on Patreon. $10 a month will get you access to the monthly bonus content and then VIP stuff, just anything else. Uh, we appreciate every single every single time you guys sent us. It keeps us going and also sets up live investigations and all that other kind of stuff. So, very good. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we will see you guys next time for another episode of Hometown Ghost Stories. See you. Mm -hmm.